So we're going to go through PowerPoint that came with your textbook. And so um, I want to go to And this one you can access. I think I gave you the code for this on the on classroom as far as for Nearpod. And so um, the only problem is um, not the beginning. Oh, that's why. I'm not on my right screen. That's that book. And then what I found out is that the e-textbook is not the same as this one. <laughs> so I have a call in to Pearson now on that one, because this is AP edition, and we just have the 13. We don't have the AP edition for the e-text. When so, do we get our textbooks? Is that today or Thursday? Uh, it's actually uh, today, okay. 7.30. All right, so I recommend that you uh, actually take some handwritten notes as we kind of go through this. Oh, that is nice and blurry. Listen. <laughs> and follow along. So what ha will happen is you, when you go back, if you want to watch this video, you'll have access to the PowerPoint, and you'll just kind of listen, and you'll you'll be able to see what. Um, and what I would probably do is pull up the PowerPoint, and then just have this playing in the background, and just kind of follow along. Okay. But chemistry, okay, it's study the property of behavior matter. In other words, what stuff made up of and how it's going to react. You don't need to know the real definition of chemistry, but that's pretty much what we're going to be studying. Okay? Now, matters made up of elements, compounds, and mixtures. Okay? So you need to just, on this picture right here, okay? When I look at this, okay, you have individual atoms right here. Okay? Atoms make up elements. Once you now we can break an atom down, and we can make it into protons, neutrons, and electrons. But they lose the properties of that element once you break it down. All protons are the same. All neutrons are the same. All electrons are the same. It's just how you put them together make up the different atoms. Once you get down to the atom, that's the smallest part. It actually comes from the Greek word atomos, which means indivisible. So way back when, in 400 BC. There was a Greek philosopher named Democritus, the same guy that came up with democracy. He, and so I guess we would call him a political scientist that we did politics and science together. And so, um, but he, he was just, I just imagined him sitting out on a rock in his toga. And he's looking down at his feet and he's seeing little pebbles and he's seeing some pebbles smaller than the other pebbles. And he just started asking himself, how low can you go, you know? How small can you get? And so he just said, there must be a smallest piece that you can't get any smaller. And he called it atomos. He's the one that coined the term atom uh, way back 400 BC. Nothing happened for 2,000 years. It wasn't until the 1700s, 1800s that we started coming through. And in early 1900s is really when we started getting an understanding of what the atom really was. It wasn't until 1905 that Einstein proved the existence of atoms. Up until then, they were thought about, but they were contested. They didn't even know. Some elements are diatomic. Okay? Now, you need to know the seven diatomic molecules. Do you remember what they are? Hydrogen. Hydrogen. Oxygen. It makes a seven. 
starting at number seven. Nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. Chlorine, bromine, and I say iodine just because so it fits the family. Okay? Well, everybody says iodine, but you know, there's a difference. Now, astatine is radioactive, so we kick it out of the group and we replace it with hydrogen. Reality is anything that ends in gen, G E N, or ene, I N E. Diatom. So when we're breathing right now oxygen gas, we're breathing in O2 molecules. Breathing in nitrogen gas, N2 molecules. There's not oxygen atoms floating around. They're always going to be in pairs, kind of like girls going to the restroom, okay? For some reason, they don't like to go by themselves. You know, it's just, hey. Now, for guys, if I said, hey, uh, hey let's go to the restroom, they're going to say, eh, I don't think so. <laughs> and so, but they're always hanging out in pairs. Now, some other molecules, like phosphorus, it's a molecular element as well. There's several different forms. There's white phosphorus, which is P4. It's four phosphorus atoms in a square. Now, it doesn't like being in that. It's highly reactive. As a matter of fact, so reactive, it reacts spontaneously with oxygen in the air. When you buy it, it's stored underwater. Okay? Because it's got to, you can't have it exposed to air at all. What do you use it for? Well, um, what the uh, sadistic people in the world figured out is that it's a great incendiary device. It causes everything to catch on fire. So they said, hey, let's make some bombs and grenades out of white phosphorus. And so they throw the, the grenade with white phosphorus and whatever the phosphorus explodes and hits and embeds in is going to catch on fire because it's going to react vigorously with the air. Now, unfortunately, if that happens to be you, you just begin burning and you can't stop it. It's not like drop, stop, drop, and roll because it's embedded in you. You have to really get underwater to stop it and exposure to oxygen. And so uh, it's really bad. In, in the 80s, there was a guy going around to, to talking to youth groups, and he had been in Vietnam, and he had been burned all the way down his whole body by a phosphorus grenade. And so uh, it's pretty nasty stuff. We don't, I used to do a demo with it, but they don't let us have it in school anymore. <laughs> so, um, but then that's white phosphorus. Red phosphorus is much more stable. It's, it's actually P8. And red phosphorus is what they use in Strike Anywhere matches. Okay? So when you use a Strike Anywhere match, that little bit of friction is going to create enough energy. It won't spontaneously react, react with oxygen, but with a little bit of friction, you can make it make it react and it basically burns the stick. That's how you light it. Okay? You guys all know what I'm talking about, the strike anywhere match, right? Usually they have the, uh, a red tip on them. Okay? And that's the red phosphorus. Okay? Uh, sulfur is another one. Sulfur is a yellow solid. We did some labs with it last year, the yellow solid. But it's S8. It forms, a, I guess, a rhombus, I think, is the S8 shape of the molecule. Uh, but that's its normal form is going to be there. Now, you generally don't have to know those, the phosphorus, the sulfurs, or, you know, the different ones, but just know that some molecules, some elements are molecular. But to, to make a compound, what's the difference then between this molecule and this molecule? Two or more different kinds. Two or more different kinds of atoms to make a, a, a compound. Since these are the same type of atoms, it's strictly going to be called, you know, yeah. element but because we have different types of atoms bonded here. And then this, lastly, is a mixture. Okay? It's a mixture. Okay, so everybody good with the difference between elements, molecules? So we, atoms make up elements, but molecules can make up elements as well. But an atom is the smallest thing. You can still break an O2 molecule apart, and you still have the characteristics of oxygen here in, in individual atoms. Okay, but if you go smaller than an atom, you lose the characteristics of the element. A molecule is the smallest part of the compound. Once you break a molecule apart, then it gives the properties of the elements. Okay, so that's kind of the same thing. Atoms are the building blocks of matter. Each element is made a unique kind of atom. Compounds made of two or more different kinds of elements. So we, we really kind of already talked about that. Okay?
So again, it's just elements are made up of atoms, compounds are made up of molecules, or two, the molecule of a, of a compound is two or more different types of atoms. Got it? All right, so how do we classify matter? We can classify matter as by two things, the state of matter and what it's made up of, okay? So you guys don't need, you don't need to worry about that. Okay, what you do need, to do, these are the basic things here. Now, I need to clarify a misconception that you're taught. It's not your fault because you were taught wrong. Because most junior high teachers are going to tell you that solids are right next to one another, liquids are a little farther apart, and gases are real far apart. That's probably exactly how you were taught the difference between solids, liquids, and gases. That's not true. Okay? Solids and liquids are both right next to one another. Okay? We know that because they're both incompressible. What does that word mean? Can't be compressed. Can't be compressed, but what does that mean? <laughs> In terms of these atoms and molecules here, what does they that mean? Keep the same volume. They keep the same volume. They keep the same volume, but when you push on them, do they get any smaller? No. Why not? Because stay, it's like, <laughs> I don't know. Because you have to. It's, it's simpler than that. They're already right next to one another. Okay, two, you know, law, two things can't occupy the same space. So they're already right next to one another. If a liquid was a little bit farther apart than a solid, it would be slightly compressible. You'd be able to make the volume smaller by pushing on it. But the molecules are already right next to one another. Okay? So... In a solid, the difference then, a solid, you have an orderly arrangement of the atoms or molecules. That's called a crystalline solid. Crystalline is always going to be, if anything's crystalline, that means that's an orderly arrangement. So crystalline means orderly arrangement. Most solids are crystalline. We don't think of metals as being a crystal, but a metal has an orderly arrangement of the atoms inside of it. It's a crystal. It's crystalline, an orderly arrangement. Does anybody know what the opposite word of crystalline would be? Non-crystalline. Yeah, that's a good guess, but that's not it. Oh, oh my. <laughs> 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 the, the eraser just disintegrated me in my hand. Good Lord, I guess I need to buy a new one. They cost a whole dollar. Opposite word of crystalline. Random arrangement. No. Amorphous. Amorphous. Can you, is that even showing up? Oh. Right here. No. There okay. You. So amorphous simply means, now morph, this, this root word of this is going to mean form or shape, okay? Uh, metamorphosis for a butterfly undergoes its change in its shape, okay? Um, if any of y'all ever watched Star Trek Deep Space Nine or any of those other Star Trek, there was a character named Morph on there because he could change his shapes, okay? Um, back in the 80s when computers were just coming out, there was a screensaver called Morph where it was a bunch of shapes that would just kind of mutate and just kind of keep changing their shape. It's called morph. So morph means shape or form. What does it mean when you put an A out front? Without. So it's without shape, without form. It's the opposite of crystalline. Okay? The opposite of crystalline. Now, so s most solids are orderly arrangement. The only difference is you heat up a liquid, heat up a solid, make it turn into a liquid. The molecules get enough energy to where they're no longer held rigidly in place. Now they just have the freedom to roll around one another. But they're still touching. They need to be touching. If you guys drove a car today, or came in a car, or came in a bus, however you got to school, it was probably some motor-driven vehicle. And we pray that the brakes work on it. Okay, so how does the pressure from the brake pedal get to the wheel? Well, 
I just press on the pedal and it stops. I <laughs> Say that again? Got a brake fluid. A brake fluid. It pushes the brake fluid. Okay? So when you push on the brake pedal, that brake fluid. Now, what's great about that is liquids can take any shape, so you can, the tubes can be bent and go anywhere they need to be to get them out of the way and hide them in the car, you know, but then that liquid gets to the brake pad. And when you push on this end of it, because they're incompressible, that pressure gets pushed all the way through those tubes, all the way to the front and the back tires, and then it hits the brake pads and puts the pressure, and that's, and if you've ever seen like a bike 10 speed where the two rubber things come and grab the tire, that's basically how car brakes work. They have discs that are on both sides and they just squeeze together and stop the car, okay? But it's the pressure being ex passed through the brake fluid because it's incompressible. Now they're amorphous, they lose their orderly arrangement. It's just random arrangement. And when, when liquids flow, I envision like marbles. Think of marbles just flowing out of a jar. So each marble being a molecule, they're just gonna roll around one another. If they were glued together, that's gonna be your solid. They're not gonna be able to roll. But as soon as you break those bonds and let them have the ability to roll, they're still right next to one another. They're just rolling over one another. And then obviously a gas completely spread apart. Okay? Now gas is spread apart. But this says vapor. What's the difference or is there between a gas and a vapor? Are we've heard the term vape, you know, hey, hey, it's vape. You know, uh, and that's become very popular these days. Um, but we hear the term vapor all the time. You gotta speak up. With a mask on, you know, you gotta speak up or just take it off while you talk. <laughs> a vapor as liquid, that's kind of what we think. It's just a, a, a wet gas. That's not exactly, it's kind of close, but it's not exactly the definition. Think of substances that are vapors. When do you hear the term vapor? Obviously water vapor. Where else? Have you ever, and you, you've never, when you're pumping gas at the gas station, you do sometimes pump gas, right? You guys just put gas in your own car. I have no. an electric car. You have an electric car? Yeah. Completely electric? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. But I do it for my mom's house. Yes, but when you look at the gas pump, it says caution, Gasoline vapors are harmful to your health. Okay? Gasoline vapor. You have alcohol vapor. You have Vicks vapor rub. So what do you think the definition of a vapor is? A gas with lots of like uh, very humid gas, if you know what I mean. Well that's kind of uh, what she was saying. Maybe it's like okay. so a gas in normal conditions. So I can be aired if you have a gas. Okay, you're you're you are like super hot, super warm. Okay, so keep going with that. Um, What's a vapor going to be then? You said a gas. It's a gas that you know under normal conditions. Yeah. That's what we call a gas. Oh, so. so what's a vapor going to be? It's like very condensed. Right? What state is water in at room temperature? Liquid. Liquid. But we can make it come a gas. Yeah. What state is gasoline in at room temperature? Oh, it's, uh, but it can evaporate quickly and become a gas, right? Yeah. So a vapor is a substance that although in the gaseous phase is normally a solid or a liquid at room temperature. That's how we're gonna differentiate between a vapor and a gas. A gas is carbon dioxide, oxygen, nitrogen, anything that's normally a gas at room temperature. A vapor is a substance that although in the gaseous phase is normally a solid or a liquid.
Okay? Just, again, it's one of those terms you hear all the time, but you don't necessarily know what you mean. Crystalline. You hear the word crystal all the time. But now we know crystalline. Anytime somebody says something's crystalline, that simply means there's an orderly arrangement. Now, there are actually two more phases of matter. States of matter. What do you think they are? Does anyone know? Plasma. plasma. Okay, so that's one we've heard about and you learned, but what is plasma? It's just another state of matter. <laughs> <laughs> well, what is it? Really hot gas. A really hot gas, but what happens to the gas when it gets really hot? Uh, kind of, sort of. Uh, you, you're, I mean, you're really going in the right track, but what, what, how does the gas decompose? Isn't that into worse, what? Isn't that worse, like, in two different phases? No. 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 <laughs> That's a Schrodinger cat experiment. You're really close. Uh, so it kind of decomposes? Okay. Yeah. It decomposes in that it knocks the electrons off. And so you have a charge, an ionic gas, a gas that has the positive, you know, the cations, and then you got free floating electrons in the air all around it. Okay? So you have positive and negative, and so it's a charged, electrically charged gas. Now that's only going to happen at high temperatures because as it cools down, the electrons and the cations are going to come back together again and form neutral molecules. Okay, so lightning, okay, the sun, um, electrical spark, anywhere we get high temperatures, um, you're going to have that. It, even in, in the upper, upper atmosphere, you have the ionosphere, which is a plasma, which is caused by the hot ultraviolet radiation and cosmic radiation coming in, and it actually ionizes the air up in that, and that's what causes the aurora borealis, the northern lights. Is, is that ionosphere and the interaction and the magnetic field and, and all of that. So anyway, so that's the fourth one is a plasma, an electrically charged gas. Only occurs at super high temperatures. So if we go the reverse of that, does anybody know what forms at super cold temperatures? It's like Einstein. It's it got Einstein in it, somebody else. Bose Einstein. Bose Einstein. Bose. Einstein condensate. Okay? Bose Einstein condensate. Now, <laughs> most of this is never going to be on my, my test or the AP test, but I just always feel the need to kind of share it with you on this. So, but the Bose Einstein, they predicted it, those two guys working together predicted it in the 1920s. Okay? It wasn't until 1995 that they were able to do it for the first time. And they got, you got to get within millionths of a degree of absolute zero. I mean, it's like almost absolute zero. And then at that point, the molecules all collapse on one another. All the atoms collapse on one another and become one big super atom, and they all act in unison. It's kind of a unique thing. But it's only going to be in these very rare, I mean, very difficult to obtain super cold temperatures but technically it's there the reality is in normal conditions solid liquid gas <laughs> so plasma is super high temperature bose einstein is super low the plasma is more common i mean you, the only way this is going to get made is in a lab all right i did small detail so here we have the classification of matter. This is everything that we're going to look at. This is going to be kind of our year in a nutshell. So we're going to have matter. We're going to break matter down. And is it uniform or not? Is it homogeneous or heterogeneous? If it's heterogeneous, it's all always it's it's a it's a mixture. Always. But if it's homogeneous, it can either be a pure substance or a homogeneous mixture. Now, a homogeneous mixture. This is, by the way, this is all in your textbook. A homogeneous mixture we call a solution. So a pure substance is going to be an element or a compound. You can have pure gold, pure silver, pure copper, pure sodium, pure oxygen, pure helium, 
pure any element. But you can also have pure carbon dioxide, pure water, pure sugar, pure salt. Compounds are also pure substances because they have one unique set of characteristics, one unique set of properties. So kind of looking at this, what we're going to do is we're going to look at elements. We're, we're going general to start with, and then as we get into chapters two and three, chapter two is more about measurement and some of that stuff. But as we get into it, we're going to then look at elements. What makes up an element? Atoms. What's the structure of the atom? Get down into the nucleus, atomic number, mass number, uh, atomic weight, all those different things that we've learned before. Just review all that quickly. And then once we do that, then we'll start looking at the electrons. Those of you that Mr. Graver, the soldier, soldier please, soldier, oh, please, yeah. don't, soldier please don't fire. Okay, the SBDF. Okay. I've tried, I've never really heard them do it. I've just heard stories about it. It's funny. Know, um, but I tried to get him to do it for me. He goes, no, I gotta I gotta you gotta be in the in the zone, you know, you gotta be but um so all your SPDF orbitals. Those of you had Miss Guthrie, you don't know what we're talking about. Okay? <laughs> So, but then, you know, once we get electrons figured out and the whole periodic table is arranged based upon electron configurations, once we get that, then we'll start bringing the atoms together and doing compounds and chemical reactions and, and naming and bonding and all the different types of things there. And then once we get finished with that, then we'll look at mixtures, properties of solutions, and specifically then acids and bases. And so that's kind of the, the progression that we're going to do through the year, you know, with with some other stuff that I'm doing. Some good stuff. Okay? So that's kind of where we're going. Foreshadowing of your whole year. <laughs> Very important. <laughs> She's doing the methanol can thing. But that was the rubber stopper. <laughs> All right, so we, this, this, we've really already talked about all this. So you don't need to write any of this down. You pretty much already have it. A substance has unique properties, okay? So a substance is either going to be an element or a compound. Compound is going to be decomposed, and element is the simplest thing. Now, what you do need to know is that this law of constant, I say definite composition. What's the formula of water? H2O. H2O. Is it ever something other than H2O? No. No. It's always H2O, right? It's got a definite composition. If I add another oxygen onto it and make it H2O2, now all of a sudden it's peroxide. Right? It's no longer water. Sugar, sucrose, C12, H22O11, every time. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to figure out what I was going to do. I change this from first period between fifth and sixth period. <laughs> Sorry. <sighs> okay. So, compounds have a definite composition by weight. There's only one way they're going to come together. So if it's going to be glucose, it's going to be C6H12O6. If it's going to be water, it's going to be H2O. If it's going to be carbon dioxide, it's going to be CO2. Definite compositions. Whereas mixtures, you can make your Kool-Aid with as much water, little water, more sugar, less sugar. You know, you can make your Kool-Aid however you want. Any, any solution... Okay, can you, a mixture can be in any ratio. So compounds, definite weight ratio, mixtures, any weight ratio. In a compound, the components lose their individual identities. Great mystery in life. How can hydrogen that's a gas, oxygen that's a gas, combine together to make liquid water? 
the hydrogen and oxygen, when they bond, they lose their individual characteristics. They're no longer gases. They're no longer having their own individual. The two become one and have their own new identity as water. The own unique set of properties. Okay? So mixtures, though, when you mix the sugar and the water, you don't want to see any smoke or fire or any, uh, you know, explosions. Okay? There's no evidence of a chemical change taking place. They retain their characteristics. So salt and water, you can evaporate the water and get the salt back. Okay? So mixing things, they retain their individual identities. In a compound, they lose their individual identities. All right. Mixtures. Mixtures exhibit the properties. Mixtures can vary in composition. They can be heterogeneous or they can be homogeneous. Okay? And a homogeneous mixture is called a solution. There's actually three types of mixtures. Three types of mixtures. I think the people that are home are uh, trying to figure out. I, think, I don't know if I put in the, I was just going to record it. I'll make a note after class. <laughs> <laughs> They're probably trying to figure out how to get on Google Meet and everything that I put out. Now, was it was it y'all that I didn't tell about the assignment? So, and then I tried to write a note, and I don't think it got posted last night either. But you guys can just turn in. The homework tomorrow. Oh, you posted it. I did post that? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, it seemed like I looked for it and I didn't see it. And I never know. It's shot posted in sixth period, seventh period. All the virtual people are in seventh, but not all of them are in sixth. Uh, you posted in the seventh period for yeah, us. Yeah, okay. So you need to be in both, I guess, classrooms. I guess think you automatically are, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Anyway, so three types of mixtures. Number one, is a solution. Smallest solid use particles. Okay? Smallest solid use particles. This is a solution. It's a solution of copper sulfate. Now, a couple of things about solutions. Number one, they're always clear. Not colorless, but transparent. You can see through them. Okay? Now, this is blocking the light some, but you can see that it's clear. Okay? A solution like this, okay, it's clear. This one's color. This one's clear blue. It's just this one's super concentrated. Okay? Number two, the copper sulfate's not going to settle out due to gravity. What keeps the copper sulfate, the copper ions and the sulfate ions, what keeps them from settling out? Polarity or lack of it. Lack of what? Uh, polarity or lack polarity? of Polarity? Well, no, but I mean, gravity is going to work no matter what. What keeps it from settling out? The solvent. Uh, in a sense, yes. The size of the particles, they are very tiny. That has something very much to do with it. It's called Brownian motion. Named after an English scientist. Uh, not named after the name, uh, he found it, he did it. Scientist named Robert Brown. This is 18 points. Just trying to figure out things, and he just looked at some pollen grains sitting on top of water, like in a petri dish, and he looked at it under a microscope. And he got everything around him perfectly still. But yet the pollen grains never stopped. They were just constantly jostling around on the top of the water. Okay? Never ever came to a rest. 
And so he didn't really know much about it. He just published that, that that's what he found. Okay? And it just kind of sat there and didn't do anything until the turn of the century. And at the turn of the century, they're having all kinds of debates on whether atoms really exist or not. Okay? And the church was saying there's no way that God's creation can be described by these simple single particles, whatever. So you know, you heard back with Galileo and all that the church, you know, kind of you know stifled scientific research because they, they felt like it was counter to God. I personally, for me, the more I understand about nature and and, and uh, how things work, the more I believe in a God. <laughs> you know, that there's only one, there's only one way that you, this all could have come together. It had to be something bigger than, it, it can't be just chance and circumstance. But that's just me. But, so, turn of the century, kind of sad. Because in 1905, Einstein came upon, or was reading about Robert Brown, he read his paper, and they had the discussion about atoms, and he was able to prove not only the existence of atoms, but he was able to show the actual measurement and mathematically calculate the size of the atoms and how tiny they were. Now, that was 1905. All from the late 1800s through the 1900s, there was another scientist, and we're going to hear about the Maxwell Boltzmann temperature dis distribution graph over and over and over and over again as we get into the year. Okay? But Boltzmann was a big proponent of atoms. But he kept getting shot down by the church and by other scientists and whatever, and he struggled with mental illness as it was. And in 1906, he ended up hanging himself. And it was sad because in 1905, Einstein had already proven that he was right. But they didn't have the internet yet, okay? And so as a result, he didn't know that he had been vindicated or he had been proven correct, and so he made a very poor decision. Okay? So there's a life lesson in that, in that when you think there isn't an answer, you just have to walk it out. Because sometimes that answer is there and you just haven't found it yet. Okay, Boltzmann, the answer was there. He was vindicated. He just made the bad decision. Yes, sir. So is gravity and motion just like random movement? Well, it's it's the cause by the fact that the molecules, man, are they're tiny atoms of this of this ion. And they're in continuous, rapid, random motion. They're constantly moving. And that motion keeps everything jarred. Well, the ions are separating. They're very much attached to the water. Okay? But it's the fact that the water molecules are continuously moving. It just keeps everything agitated. As long as the particles are small, that normal agitation of the small molecules keep them all suspended and keep it stirred up. And that's called Brownian motion. So what you think of cold enough? Like stop moving or well that's what yeah, and it freezes. Okay, yeah. yeah. And then absolute zero, everything stops yeah. completely. So temperature is actually a measure of the average kinetic energy. In other words, how fast the molecules are moving. And so the colder they are, the slower they are, the hotter they are, the faster they are. Heat them up, speed them up. Okay? So solutions, they don't settle out. If I try to put this through a piece of filter paper. Could I filter this? The blue will go right through, right? Yeah. Because the particles are so small. Filter paper is actually just paper that's got little tiny holes in it. Okay? And it collects the big stuff, but the little stuff can get through, like the water. But since the solute particles are on the same size as the water, it goes right through with it. So you can't filter that out. An even smaller filter is a semi-permeable membrane. What is that? It's like only some things can get through and some can't. Like the cell membrane, right? Only some things can get through. Solute particles can, are small enough, they can even get through a, a, a semi permeable membrane. They're the tiniest of all the particles. So they don't sell out due to gravity. Okay? They're always going to be clear, not necessarily colorless, but clear. Okay? Can't be filtered. Now, our second one is a colloid. And this is medium-sized particle. Okay? It still will not sell out due to gravity.
it can't cannot be filtered. But will not pass through. A semi permeable membrane. Okay. And then lastly, so some are homogeneous, some are heterogeneous, depending on how big. This is, these are like going to be like big protein molecules, fat molecules, molecules that are just the real big ones, okay? They're not small enough to get through a semi-permal membrane, but they're still too small enough to get through a piece of filter paper. And it gives the Tyndall. Anybody remember what the ten dollar effect is? Yes, ma'am. Yep. If you shine a light through it, three page three sixty. Very good. Nobody in the other class remember that. No, I thought it was three sixty. So this right here is your $10 effect. Oh, don't work on that $10. Come on. So here you're just shining a light. Notice you don't see the light here, but you do see the beam of light there. Seeing the beam of light is causing light to scatter. The particles are big enough that causes the light to scatter, and you can see it. Now, all of us have experienced this $10 effect in our everyday life. If you've ever gone to the beach and you go out at nighttime with a flashlight and you shine the flashlight up into the sky, you see the beam of the flashlight. That's the $10 effect. It's because the dust particles in the air are causing the light to scatter and you, so you can see the beam. If you're driving down a country road there's not a whole lot of street lights and all that. On a normal, nice night, you can see your headlights out and you can see the beam and it's all good. But if it's a rainy night, if it's still raining or it just stopped raining, the rain washes all the dust out of the air. And so you're on these, this country road, it's sometimes hard to tell if your lights are on or not because you're not getting any of the scattering because there's no dust particles in the air. And then the extreme, opposite extreme of that, is what do you do with fog? You got high beams off, you put low beams, and if you have fog lights, they're gonna be way down low. Because there you have massive amounts of water molecules, which are gonna be the, but they're drops of water. They're not water molecules, they're big drops. And as a result, you get massive scattering of light, and you just get this white sheet of light in front of you if you have your, if you have your high beams on. Okay, so that's just a $10 effect on steroids. Okay, so we've all experienced this at some point. So you see the beam. So the, one of the only ways to tell the difference between a colloid and a, and a solution is to shine the light. And you can tell, I mean, because without the light on, these are going to look pretty much identical. All right, the third one. I'm out of board space. The third one. Maybe you Erase my aspirin. Anyone? What's the third type of mixture? Suspension. Suspension. Okay. 
Okay? This is your biggest particles. Okay? So these are the ones that can be filtered. Okay? Uh, settle out due to gravity. In other words, the particles are too big for the water molecules, random motion of the molecules to keep agitated because they're way bigger than the water molecules. The water molecules hit them, but they just kind of bounce off. They don't do anything. Okay? Settle out due to they're, they're going to be opaque. What does that word mean? Can't see through it? Okay, I'm going to show you an example of that in a second. Okay? And gives the $10 effect. Biggest thing is you can filter with filled paper, okay, and you, and you can't see through it. So when we come back, I'll do a quick demo for you, and then we need to just get close. I need to just go a little bit farther, and then we're going to be done, and then we're going to go. Then I'm actually going to start going over the questions for you, and you guys can start filling them in, because it's my fault that I didn't tell you, so... Today is the day to go over those kind of chapter questions. <laughs> so you'll just get to fill them in as we go, and then you'll get your credit for it. I know you're going to be disappointed in that, right? There you go. So nitrate is what? NO3 minus. But it's minus one, so what's the formula of lead 2 nitrate going to be? N2O6. No, we don't do N2O6. NO3 2. NO3 2. We put the NO3 in parentheses because that's the polyatomic ion. That's the single thing. Put that in parentheses with the 2. And it too is aqueous. So what type of reaction is this? Double replacement. Very good. Okay. <laughs> How do you remember that? <laughs> so, so double replacement means is what's going to happen? What are we going to make? Flip flop. Flip flop is what we're going to make. Potassium nitrate. Potassium nitrate, but we don't carry substrates. Potassium plus one, nitrate's minus one, so it's just KNO three. What's the other thing going to be? PbI two. Is plus two and minus one. Okay? So those are our two products. But then we have to balance it. Yeah, we got to balance by pushing two and it's two. All right. Where's my, here's my lead nitrate. Okay? So you can see the lead nitrate is also a clear colorless solution. Okay? And so when we mix, can you know, I write on the camera here? Can I yeah, see? I'm just... Okay. When you mix this, you get a bright yellow, but notice now how it's gone opaque. It's cloudy. That's an indication that a precipitate has formed. It's now a suspension. Okay? The, 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 one, of the, one of the products is a solid, an insoluble solid that formed. Okay? And you can see already it's beginning to settle out due to gravity just down here on the bottom, it's already starting to fall, okay? So, this is the one I did in the first period. So you can see all of the yellow now is pretty much sitting at the bottom. It's settled out due to gravity because the particles are too big, there you go, too big in order for the water to keep it suspended. So in a suspension, they settle out due to gravity. Colloids and solutions are small enough they stay suspended because of the Brownian motion. Okay? Is there any you can tell? Like, there's no way by just telling, like, looking at our eyes, the difference between a solution and a colloid? Not really. It's really shining the light through it. Now, some colloids, if it's a real big colloid, solute particle, um, it'll be heterogeneous. You can kind of see the different parts. Okay? Um, but if it's small, it's right on the borderline between colloid and uh, solution. Can't really tell. All right. Too much fun. Sorry, computer. 
So mixtures, and I just kind of added in the three types. That's really in chapter 13 of your book, but I just kind of like to throw that out there so we can just kind of see. The only thing that's really different is small, medium, large. Okay, and, and most of the, you know, the properties are pretty straightforward. Okay, so physical properties, chemical properties. So if I look at, and I got rid of the rest of this, if I look at this piece of paper, okay. What can you tell me about this piece of paper? It's terrible. White. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> okay. Um, what else? It's white. I heard somebody say. It's a solid. It's a solid. Okay. What else? What else could we tell about this? It has mass. It has mass. We can measure the mass of it. We can measure the length and the width. And let's assume that it was straight by hypotenuse. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Okay, we, but we could measure and get length, width, height, volume, mass. Those are all, anything that we can determine about this piece of paper without changing the identity of it is a physical property. Okay? But a chemical property is one that's going to describe, well, what chemical reactions do they do? Well, does it burn? Well, let's find out. Let's burn. Does it react with acid? I don't know. Let's find out. Let's put it in acid. But when doing it, you're going to change the composition of it. Chemical properties describe the chemical reactions that are going to take place. Then you guys, we'll, we'll look at these. This is, you guys did that in the first week in chemistry one. And now, when we're dealing with physical properties, there are two types, an intensive and extensive. You do need to make sure you know this. An intensive property is one that's internal. It doesn't matter how much of the substance you have. So the boiling point of water is going to be the same, 212 degrees Fahrenheit or 100 degrees Celsius, whether you have a cup of water or a gallon of water. Okay? Water is going to be clear and colorless, no matter if you have a cup of water or a gallon of water. Water is going to freeze at 32 degrees Fahrenheit or 0 degrees Celsius, whether you have a cup of water or a gallon of water. Okay? So any of the properties that aren't going to change with the amount are intensive. They're the ones that are really used to describe and identify a substance. On the other hand, length, width, mass, volume, anything that de is dependent upon how much of the substance you have, that's called an extensive property. Intensive are much more valuable than extensive. Now, we need both if, we, if we're doing calculations and things. We've got to have the mass. Sometimes we need the length, width, and height to calculate the volume so we can calculate the density. Okay? So they're still important, but intensive help identify substance way better. Okay? Now, right along the exact same thing, that a physical change is a change of any change that doesn't change the identity, but a chemical change is going to change the identity of the substance. You're going to form a new substance with new properties. And we'll go through and when we look at the ones, there's a bunch of these in the textbook as far as practice on this, and we'll do that here in a second. Okay? So physical change, chemical change, physical properties, chemical properties, they kind of go hand in hand. There's, there's not that much difference between the two. Now, the biggest thing is change in state. Going from a solid to a liquid to a gas, ice to water to steam is still H2O, so it's still a physical change. Dissolving sugar into water or salt into water, you can evaporate the water off, it's still going to be a physical change. Okay? So, and this is just here converting between the states, it's a physical change. Chemical reactions, you're going to form a new substance with new properties, okay? 
Okay, you just get new substance. That's the whole thing. Is the hydrogen and oxygen make water? They lose their individual. They form a new substance. Okay, during a chemical change. All right, this is what we don't want to end up with today. Okay, mixtures can be separated based on the physical properties. Now, filtration, we know that's pretty obvious. That's the size of the particle. I mean, we can just do filter paper and just filter it. I mean, I don't need to demonstrate that for you. You know, just anytime you make coffee and you put the coffee grinds into the filter, it's doing the exact same thing. Okay? But distillation, what is distillation? What does it mean to have distilled water? <laughs> like only water, nothing else? Only water, but how do they get it? They let it sit. They let it sit. No, that's going to collect stuff. This right here is a, is a distillation apparatus. Okay? So I have some calcium chloride, just nasty water in here. Okay? I am now running cold water. There's a tube inside this tube right here. So on the outside, there's cold water running. Then there's a tube on the inside that the water is designed to cool. So I'm going to heat this up. It didn't work very well first period, but I think I have it. Now, as this is heating up, you guys have heard of moonshine, right? And if you ever watch the show Moonshiners, moonshine is they make the alcohol, and then you have to distill it. You have to you have their stills which is usually the big pot, and then they had the copper coils coming off of it, going down, and there's all kinds of different types of stills. But it's all about, you have the alcohols in this mash of yeast and, and corn and all the different things in there, but you just want to get the alcohol out. And so you heat it up gently, and the alcohol evaporates and everything else stays behind. But then you have to collect that, and you got to cool it. So when they have the copper coils, they just air cool it. So the alcohol, as it just goes through the coils, is just slowly cooled and then drips out as pure alcohol. Okay? So we're kind of going to do the same thing here. As this gets heated up, the steam, the water is going to evaporate off. The ionic compounds that are in here are have way high, higher boiling point than the water. So the water is going to boil off first. Now, if this is a mixture of water and alcohol, we want to control the temperature because alcohol but, uh, evaporates, boils at about 78, 9, I think it's 79 degrees Celsius, whereas water is 100 degrees. So if you can keep the temperature right there at the 78, 79, then only the alcohol is going to, well, mainly the alcohol is coming off and only a little bit of water. Okay? So now, it's not boiling yet, but it's getting close. So now the water vapor is starting to work its way up into here. It's going to come down here, and you'll start seeing drips into here. We're distilling the water. We're heating it up, vaporizing the water, and then that leaves all the impurities behind, and then we recollect it and condense it back into pure water. Okay? Now, if I hadn't contaminated this, I could take it, and then once this gets here, we could test it with electricity. Pure water doesn't conduct electricity, but this solution will. Okay? But so when you get to something that's distilled, and, and just the difference between, you know, just cheap vodka versus top shelf vodka, is how many times do they distill it? The more times you distill it, the purer it gets, the better it gets. And so that's when you, when you can deal with alcoholic beverages. The, the top shelf, the expensive ones, have been distilled many times over. Okay? Um, so now we have a lot of steam being generated. Then we have a drip right here. Instead of going down, I see a drip coming down right here on the inside. There we go. See, it just dropped down in. Okay? We got a bad connection here for some reason. Okay, but we can just let this keep going and just keep purifying. So all of this water that's coming down is pure water. Okay, so all of this that's collecting is going to be distilled of just water. All right, that's distillation. 
the key on distillation and what you need to write down for distillation is it uses a difference in boiling points. It's based on differences in boiling points. Filtration obviously is size of particles. And then chromatography, the very last thing we got to talk about. Okay, so there's filtration. There's your distillation. Look very similar to what we just saw. Okay. Chromatography. Now this example that's in the book is column chromatography, which is much more common in industry, but we're we're only going to be responsible for paper chromatography. And what you do is if you had a piece of paper, you put a, a dot like a red, uh, some kind of marker or some dot on there. And you put that down into a beaker that has a solvent. Okay? Now we know by capillary action that solvent is going to begin to rise up the paper. Okay? Now, if this is a polar solvent, whatever polar parts are in that mixture of the ink that you put on here, the more polar it is, the more, because light dissolves light, polar dissolves polar, nonpolar dissolves nonpolar. So if this is a polar solvent, the pol most polar part of this dot is going to go up the highest. The most nonpolar part of the dot is going to stay near the bottom, because it's not going to be attracted to the water or to the solvent. On the other hand, if you have a nonpolar solvent, like acetone or a hexane or some organic compound, the nonpolar is going to go up higher and the polar is going to stay at the bottom. Okay? Light dissolves light. So if the, whatever the solvent is, whatever's in your mixture you're trying to separate is going to go with the solvent. So the mo if it's nonpolar solvent, the nonpolar is going to go the highest. If it's a polar solvent, the polar goes the highest. So let's just say that we get you know, two different dots. This is where it started, okay? So then you measure that distance from this distance. How far did the solvent go versus how far did that particular color, that particular separation, that particular substance go? And we get what's called the RF factor, which is equal to distance of substance divided by the total distance of the solute, or pardon me, the solvent. Okay? So whichever one, again, with the highest, we can tell it's most polar, if it's a polar solvent. If it's a nonpolar, whichever one. And you can kind of then kind of guess based upon this RF factor. I'll show you tomorrow, well, or Thursday, I'll show you uh, some AP problems, just with chromatography, real basic, simple problems. Okay? All right. That's where we're going to stop as far as the PowerPoint. What slide is that? That's slide 20. You want to make a note.